Congratulations, you've made it to the very last section of the entire course. We are learning about the area that's created between two different functions. So in the last um, chapter, we learned that a definite integral represented the area between a function and the x-axis from a given x value to another given x value. So the question is, what if you don't want to go all the way down to the x-axis? What if you want to know about an area that is enclosed by two functions, um, either because they intersect or because you'll be told a starting and stopping point? So notice that if I wanted this area that gets closed in by where f and g cross, then if I found all of the area that's underneath f down to the x-axis, which is labeled a2, but then I subtracted off the area underneath of f, g um, going down to the x-axis that is not what I wanted, then I'd be left with the highlighted part on the front first picture that is between f and g. So I simply need to find the area under each one and subtract them to get that middle area that is what I was looking for. That's really going to be all there is to it. So if I if I translate uh, these into integrals, well, a2 is the integral from a to b of what function are we finding the area under, right? f. And then I'm subtracting off from that the area from a to b underneath of g. So I can just do those integrals as they are and then subtract. Um, but if you think about it, if they're going to have some like terms, then using uh, properties of integrals and actually treating this as a single integral and subtracting first and combining like terms could end up being less calculus work. So we can actually go ahead and put them in the same integral and say, okay, if we want to find the area between two functions, now I'd rather you not get hung up on f and g, because what if it's g and f, and they're named differently, and they're in different orders. So what's a lot more important is to focus about which one's higher, literally higher, since y values go up and down. We're talking about the higher y-valued function minus the lower y-valued function. So we're going to integrate from a to b, just like we've been doing, of higher function minus lower function. Sometimes it'll be really clear which one's higher and sometimes just kind of how it looks it might be a trick on the eye. So you can either plug in a test value between a and b to see what y values you get and therefore which one's higher or you can also kind of take a vertical slice and see which function literally hits that line higher. Again, this picture it's very obvious that f is higher than g, but some of them you might find you need to slow down for a minute. So this box down here is really the entire section, but we'll look at a couple examples and see the different um, ways you could see this. So in the first example, notice that you're not given an a and a b. What that means is the two graphs must intersect and you need to find the a and the b yourself by finding the points of intersection. That would be the points that f and g share. Um, you should be able to do this without a picture. However, I've provided a graph because it is such a visual thing. But you should not be reliant on the graph. So what I mean by that is, yes, we can check our answer on the limits of integration, those points of intersection based on the graph that's there. But you should be able to find them algebraically. So as a review from algebra, to find points of intersection, we set the two functions equal to each other. We do that because you can think of f of x as y equals and g of x also as y equals. If it's a point they share, their y's should be the same. So I'm basically setting their y's equal to each other and seeing the x's that make that happen. So if I set these two functions equal to each other, then um, I see that the highest power is x squared here, so my strategy is to get 0 on one side. And when I do, I have x squared minus 1, which is a difference of squares factoring problem. And so I get that x equals negative 1 and x equals 1 are the x values of the points of intersection of these two graphs. And then, yes, you can come over here and check that that's there, 
But again, you should have the algebraic skills to do that without a picture provided um, and do it algebraically. So now those limits of integration or those um, points of intersection become our limits of integration. And whenever we're the ones setting up the problem and we get to choose, you always put the smaller one on the bottom and the bigger one on the top. And then we're doing higher minus lower. So this is a good example of one where, for whatever reason, some of my students have a hard time knowing which order to subtract here. So I could use a test value. We're going from negative 1 to 1, so 0 is an x value that's in between that interval. If I plug 0 into f, I'll get 0 squared plus 2 times 0 plus 3. I'll get 3. If I plug 0 into g, I'll get 2 times 0 plus 4, which is 4. So g gave me a higher number, 4, than 3 did. So it's literally higher. And of course, note here that g is a linear. It's got a highest power of x, so it's the dashed green line. And f is a quadratic, so it must be the red solid line. Or the other thing you can do is take just a vertical slice. So take a straight up and down line. If the axis is part of it, then that's an easy way to do it. And you're literally seeing which one touches that line higher. So sometimes just looking at a single slice can help you see it better. But you can see the green dash line hits it at 4. Um, and the red line hits it here, or red curve hits it here at 3. So we've now established that the green dash line, g of x, is higher in y values over that interval than f of x is. So when we set up our interval, we already set integral. We already said we're going from negative 1 to 1. And we need to do the higher function minus the lower function. So it is, for this problem, going to be the 2x plus 4 minus the quadratic. Now I have to be really careful here because this has multiple terms. And so I need to have that parentheses because the minus will affect it. So I'm going to distribute that negative and combine like terms before I integrate so that instead of integrating five terms, I'm just integrating two. Hypothetically, we're better at algebra and calculus is new to us, so you'd want to do more algebra, less calculus. Hypothetically. I know you may disagree. All right, so once we've simplified and we only have two terms, we're ready to integrate. And so I need the reverse power rule for both of those. Remember that once I do the antiderivative, the integral sign's gone, but I'm not done. I still need to plug the 1 and the negative 1 in, so this is my notation for that. Plug 1 into the entire thing, minus parentheses, plug negative 1 into the entire thing. And then work it out. So I get 4 thirds. So if you look at this area that is shaded in red there, the area of that is 4 thirds square units. All right, so in terms of just a traditional area between two curves, that's kind of as bad as it gets where you're not given your a and your b and you have to find them by finding points of intersection. And all that is is setting two functions equal to each other and solving. The slightly easier case is when they tell you the a and the b. So they tell me two functions and they tell me two x values. And so those x values are going to be my a and my b. We should also look at these two functions and make sure we know which is which. So notice that f is a quadratic with a positive a. So it should open up, and that's why I've labeled that one f. g is a quadratic with a negative a, the coefficient out in front of the highest, um, that x squared term. So it should open down, and that's why I've labeled the solid green line there. <coughs> so. Um, we're going to be integrating from a to b, the numbers they gave us, and that's where this one's nicer than the previous one. And we need to do higher minus lower. Well, this one's pretty cut and dry. The red function is clearly above the green function. Um, definitely on the interval we're talking about from x equals 1 to x equals 2, uh, but then actually beyond that. So we have higher minus lower. We do need parentheses here because the negative is going to affect it. We're going to combine like terms. And then we're ready to integrate. We apply the reverse power rule and simplify along the way. Then we need to plug 2 into the whole thing, minus parentheses, plug 1 into the whole thing. And we end up getting 3 square units. So again, you absolutely should be able to do this without the graph provided. I have just done it so that you can really wrap your head around it and so that you can kind of check your work at the end. So notice that in um, blue or black pen, I've shown you 
square units. So here's two perfect square units. And then they're curvy, but if we could um, piece together this little piece and this upper one, they would become a third square unit. So it is nice just sometimes to do like a reasonability check, even if you're not actually computing area um, on this graph. If you had gotten 27 or something, then there's no way. It doesn't make sense, right? But three square units, even if you don't agree that, that these curvy parts quite look right, it does work out. But at least you're close. At least it's reasonable. So the very last problem of the entire course. All right. This is truly as bad as they can get, okay? So the problem is in both of those past problems, one of the functions was always above the other for our interval. What if they switch partway through your interval and one function is higher for part of it and the other function is higher for the other part of it? So I very formally refer to these as crisscross problems, okay? So during the interval provided, the functions crisscross each other, therefore changing which one's higher and which one's lower. So you can see that we're going from an x of 0 to an x of 3. But during that time, there's this spot here where they crisscross. And therefore, which one is higher and which one's lower changes, and that matters. So they did give me an a and a b, but they did not give me this crisscross point. And it is a point they share. It's a point of intersection. We've already done this. So we're going to set them equal to each other to find that point. Yes, I understand the graph is there for you to look at, but you should not have to have it. This is what you would do if you did not have the graph to look at. So we set them equal to each other. In this case, the x squareds cancel no matter what you do. And we get x equals 1. So from 0 to 1, one thing's happening, and from 1 to 3, another thing's happening. So I have it color-coded. I have red shaded for the area that's between these two functions from 0 to 1, and then I have black shading from 1 to 3 for the area between the two functions. And we need to think about what's happening. So on 0 to 1, the green dashed line is higher. Again, you could use a test value or you could just take a vertical slice and see that the green dashed line hits that vertical slice higher than the red one does. So it's always higher minus lower in this case it's going to be that green dashed one um, that is higher. Now, I, I should have talked about, since you are given a graph to look at, which is which, process of elimination, if nothing else, okay? y equals x squared is just your classic parabola centered at, at 0. So that one's f, and so by process of elimination, the other one's g. Um, but also, if you factor this, it's x minus 2 quantity squared, meaning it's the x squared graph shifted 2 to the right. So you can also see that. So on the interval from 0 to 1, the green dashed one, which was the x squared minus 4x plus 4 one, was higher. So it should go first and then minus lower. Then we can simplify, and we'll just do our antiderivatives with the reverse power rule, plug 1 into the whole thing, plug 0 into the whole thing, and get an answer. And so this is really just like a part A and a part B, where you're just asking me to do in two little problems in one. So that's what was going on from 0 to 1, but that's only part of my area. From 1 to 3, in the black shaded area, you can see that the red one's higher. So if I take a vertical slice, the red one, which was regular f of x equals x squared, is above where the green dashed one hits my vertical line. So f is higher there, meaning f needs to come first in my subtraction. So now higher minus lower is flipped. It's x squared is higher minus parentheses, because there's multiple terms, x squared minus 4x plus 4 is lower. Notice when I simplify, oops, um, I am going to get some of the same numbers, but I don't want to just fudge this. I am looking for you to have higher minus lower correctly there. And so I am going to get to use some of the same thinking numerically when I do my reverse power rules, but my signs will be different. So I do my antiderivatives. Integral signs are gone because I've done what they said, but I'm not done because I still have the 3 and the 1 to plug in. So I plug the 3 into the whole thing, minus parentheses, plug 1 into the whole thing. So this is um, the first time you're getting to see why I use a bracket 
as um, what I put my little numbers on when I have integrated but I'm not done. Again, some books you'll see a straight line and that's fine. But the nice thing about having it be a bracket is that when needed, it can actually be a bracket at the same time and be a grouping symbol. So you're just going to work them both out and it's up to you whether you would do the whole red problem and the whole black problem and then add them together um, or if you would kind of go line by line. It doesn't matter, but ultimately I need to add those two areas together. So I got um, two for the red area, eight for the black area when I add them together. The total area covered by both the red shading and the black shading is the 10. So I will say I have um, in the past sometimes on these more complicated problems asked um, just for the setup but not the solving because you're doing plenty of antiderivatives other places. So if you were just asked to set it up but not integrate or solve, you would stop right above my yellow horizontal line that I just drew. That shows me that you understand the different regions, that the point of intersection is the place where it changes, and that you understand which one is higher and lower in each scenario. So what matters here are the limits of integration, which one's higher, which one's lower, that you're adding it to the other area, that you know those limits of integration, and then which one's higher and which one's lower there. So, um, if you are asked just to set it up, I actually don't even want the subtracted simplified that's below my big horizontal line because the one above the big horizontal line better shows that you knew it was higher minus parentheses lower um, in order to do this. Anyway, so that is it. It really is just in general doing the higher minus the lower y-valued function. I will make one more point going back to the definition box. We do need to be careful because I know that this idea of definite integrals is pretty new. And when we learned it, we talked about how we do an antiderivative and then we plug in the upper limit of integration minus parentheses the lower limit of integration. That is a separate concept from this new concept of if I want the area between two functions, I need to do the higher y-valued function minus the lower y-valued function. So I guess what I'm saying is sometimes I get students that feel like they've already done some sort of higher minus lower and then they forget to do it when they're actually evaluating. And I'm very clear with my language on that and I try to use upper limit of integration and lower limit of integration for that versus higher y-valued function and lower y-valued function um, for this. And so basically the way to think about this is we already talked, well we've done it both ways. Um, first, if I want the area between f and g vertically, I need to find all the area from the x-axis up to f and then take away the area from the x-axis to g that I don't want. So that's what that first subtracting is doing. Then if you were to go back to when we first learned these limits of integration, that part is addressing, okay, now you've done your antiderivative and we're sweeping out area, well, I plug in B to get all of this area from zero to B horizontally, but then I find, um, I plug in A to find all of this area over to A and take it away because I don't want it, and then I end up with the middle. So basically, um, on the inside here, when we do higher minus lower, that's kind of us fixing it vertically to take off any area we don't want. And then, as with all definite integrals, when we do the um, b and the a and subtract them, that's like us uh, horizontally fixing it by taking off any area that we don't want. So do be careful that you don't mix up those two ideas um, between subtracting a higher function minus a lower function when you're finding the area between two functions specifically. Um, and after simplifying and finding an antiderivative of that, the separate concept of plugging in our limits of integration and subtracting. I hope that helps.